All right, folks, uh, thanks for showing up this evening. We have a busy night ahead of us, so we're going to start off quickly and early. Um, so first on the agenda is Mr. Thompson from the San Antonio Water System. He's going to be talking to us about the uh, Vista Ridge Pipeline. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for inviting me here tonight. Again, my name is Derek Thompson. I am the Director of Water Resources at SAUS. And before I start off, how many people have heard of the Vista Ridge Project, the Pipeline? It's a utility well I've heard about it. So why are we doing the project? Why are we contemplating the project? Well, back in the early 90s, uh, there was a lawsuit that was filed on behalf of uh, protecting the endangered species of Canal and San Marcos Spring. That lawsuit put in, put in effect uh, the creation of the Rivers Hospital Authority, which uh, began to limit the amount of water that could be produced at the end of the Because of that limit, or cap, on the end of the we knew that going forward, San Antonio would have to diversify its water supply. The Edwards, there's not enough, there are not enough permits in the Edwards uh, to produce, to, to meet the needs of San Antonio going forward. So we started planning for a diversified portfolio of supplies. So back in 1998, we took the first uh, step towards that plan and we started looking at various options across uh, South Central Texas. We looked at the trees along, we looked at uh, ASR, we looked at direct recycle projects. Uh, river basin projects uh, in Colorado and also as well as um, As we move forward, we refined what we were going after. Uh, we developed several projects uh, as we move forward. Uh, we, we built the largest direct recycled water uh, program in the country, uh, which has a capacity of 35,000 acre feet of water that we actually take from our treatment plants and in the southern portion of the county, we pipe it back into our system, or a separate system, not the focal system. But we provide water to golf courses, uh, corporations for landscape irrigation, um, also for heating and cooling uh, processes. So that reduces the demand on the focal side, which we were providing with the other offer. Um, we also developed the third largest aquifer storage impairment project in the country, and that is located in Southern Area County. Have y'all heard about the ASR or Aquifer Storage Recovery Project? It is, it has been a godsend as far as uh, the projects for us. It is, we take excess permits from the Edwards. So in years that we have adequate rainfall, we have excess supply of our community, we take that, we produce water out of the Edwards, and we ship it down to Southern Mary County, and we store it into the Carrizo Walk. Then in dry times, such as what we're in right now, we actually produce that of it and we send it back to town. And it still, for the most part, retains its Edwards quality. So it's very little treatment that we need uh, to make that water uh, fit for our customers. So that was the second. Uh, we also developed uh, supplies or projects that the Trinity offered in Northern Bear County. They're small, but they, they, they fill that need in the northern portion of our service area. Um, we also developed Another project in Southern Bear County uh, and in Carrizo, it's just, it's just north where we have our store vendors. So out of the Carrizo water, out of the Carrizo aquifer, uh, we produce another roughly 10,000 acre feet of water uh, to send back to our customers. And we, we do that during dry times, just like we're right now. So we produce that in the Carrizo, we produce the store vendors in the Carrizo, sitting back to town. We also produce the tuning out of water uh, in Northern Bear County. We also developed a project in Gonzales County, also from the Carrizo, um, that we, uh, we got permits from the groundwater district of Gonzales County to produce roughly 12,000 acre feet of water. Um, we got into a partnership agreement with Shirts and Local Government Corporation to use excess capacity in the pipeline that they'd already built uh, to bring water in San Antonio that saved us about $88 million by doing that partnership. So that water is online. We're trying to wrap up uh, the construction of that project that we already received in March. Finally, since we're in the fourth year of drought. Um, <clears throat> we also, we've started construction on our brackish diesel project in Southern Bear County. That's producing water out of the Wilcox, the lower Wilcox aquifer. So we have actually three different supplies in Southern Bear County that we can kind of use as a hub, bringing water to town. We're also developing a water resource integration pipeline which takes water 
uh, from that ASR, that hub, and so they can, and we pipe it around into the, we're going to pipe it around to the western side of San Antonio where we see a tremendous amount of growth. So those are all the projects that we that we started, that we have completed, um, that are supplementing and diversifying our need off the others. So the next step, we know the San Antonio is growing. We're anticipating about 20,000 persons per year in our service area. Some people say that's too low, um, which is why we want to make sure that we have adequate supplies that not just barely meet our needs, but take us ahead. This is where the Vista Ridge project comes online. Back in 2009, in our water management plan, we identified a potential supply um, that would that we would actually go out for bids. We would actually um, send out proposals asking people to bring us uh, projects, proposed projects uh, that were um, adequate and met their needs. We received nine proposals back in 2011. Review those proposals. We interviewed the three finalists and the Miss Ridge Consortium, which is made up of Avenue, which is a Spanish uh, corporation, and also Blue Water, which owns the water rights and is out of Boston. So the project is out of Burleson County. It is 50,000 acre feet, so it is larger than any other project we've ever developed. So this project, 50,000 acre feet, is water that is permitted in the groundwater district, which is a huge plus. Um, we've had issues in the past developing our own supplies in Dallas County. Uh, we had also looked at developing supplies in Wilson County. They're all covered by groundwater districts, and there's a difficulty in developing or getting permits. So this project already comes with permits. Thirty year production and transportation permits, they have to be renewed. All permits for groundwater districts have to be renewed. These are longer than most. Uh, this project was then um, put in effect, or put in our 2012 water management plan as a supply that will fill the needs um, in the plan in 2018. So we were going to bring it a little sooner than originally anticipated. When we began the uh, negotiations uh, with Mr. Ridge, which were actually Posted open to public meetings. Uh, there was over seven meetings that were held in which um, our executive management and support members uh, negotiated with the Vista Ridge uh, Consortium. In front of the media, in front of anybody that's willing to come and support our meeting. Um, they, had down, they, they locked down the project. All risk is transferred over to those entities. To uh, they are responsible for building the well field. They're responsible for building the pipeline and all the infrastructure that is needed to produce the water and then transport the water to the North America. In, the, uh, in, your, in your handout, if you don't have a handout, I have a few more. Uh, but there is a map that shows. Um, there is a map on the front, the lower right, that shows the, the general. Uh, layout of the pipeline going from Burleson County. It's basically seven counties in Burleson and Bear. The project will tie in in Northern Bear County, uh, in the Stone Oak area. And then that then we will actually develop infrastructure uh, from the Stone Oak and run it all the way down south of downtown. So basically the core of our city will be provided water for this project. Um, now this project is not it's not cheap. None of the water supply projects uh, that, that are out there right now are cheap. Um, our Brackishly cell project is roughly $1,200 to $1,300 an acre foot, uh, which is considered expensive relative to the Edwards offer. Uh, the Edwards, very cheap. It's right on the ground, under our feet. Uh, it's roughly $300 to $500 an acre foot, depending on drought restrictions or energy conditions. This water. With uh, debt service, uh, paying for the capital, which is $844 million. So it is twice as much as what we're spending on our uh, Brackish Diesel project in Southern Bird County. Uh, the project, 
the $1,800 to, to $2,000 that is actually for the capital cost and the purchase of the water, plus the ODEM, which is roughly another $175 uh, annually, and then another $175 for the electrical cost. So the total cost of the project roughly in between $2,200 and $2,400 per foot. So again, it is expensive, but that price is locked in for four years. So if you can buy gas today at $2.85 a gallon, and you've got it locked in for 30 years, that's a pretty good deal. That's basically what this is. We're locking in this project at today's prices for roughly $22 to $24 per foot. Um, and that, this project has not been approved by city council. Uh, it has been approved by our board. Uh, we had some minor contract provisions uh, last week that were approved, uh, but this goes to City Council uh, on the 30th of October. The contract is online on our website, so you can download it, go through it. Uh, all of our management plans are online as well. Um, we also have uh, semi-annual reports that we produce to City Council for City Council, and it has all of our costs, all of our projects, and how much we spent all projects and so forth. Uh, so everything is there for you to, to review just um, that. So right now, originally I had mentioned that uh, the project would be online as far as our planning goes by 2018. Well that has slipped a little bit because of the negotiations and the time. Uh, but we're looking at this project going online in 2020. Now, again, it is not cheap. We are looking at the uh, roughly 60% increase uh, in rates for the average customer. And that is leading up to 2020 or in 2020 when we actually take, uh, take, or take delivery of the water. So, now we understand that not everybody uses a lot of water. And we want to make sure that, that they're not bearing the burden of uh, the cost of this project. So right now we actually have a rates advisory committee that is meeting, which is made up of consists of appointees from city council. They are looking at our rate structures, how we how we charge individuals. Let's go. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have a lifeline rate that is that is in effect for those that don't use a lot of water. We want we don't want to place the burden on those individuals, the ones that use the water. Um, and there's also been, there's been comments um, that we are um, getting away from our conservation ethic. That you know we are we are leaders in conservation across the country. Um, we we are well ahead of any other city that I'm aware of. That I'm aware of. Um, that, that is not the case. We're still uh, refocusing our conservation efforts to be uh, more impactful to uh, peak demand or peak usage. So driving down the, the, the summer demand patterns with individuals uh, watering lawns and so forth, uh, when, the, when the stress on the, on the outcome right now is, is the greatest. Um, so that is not the case. We are pushing forward. Um, well, over the last three years, during drought, um, we've seen our demand, actually per capita, our gallons per person per day, uh, drop off into the mid 120s, which uh, you know also kind of touts itself as a as a very uh, friendly city to the environment, and they're not even close to what we're doing right now. Uh, so that that effort is and will continue to move forward next year. Um, See. I apologize, this is my second presentation tonight, so um, that is, that kind of covers the, the, the bulk of the project. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions or any specific I have two questions. The first one is how does the Carrizo aquifer compare to the Edwards aquifer in size? And my second question is, I see your pipeline is going right past Austin. What, what is Austin, in, is Austin involved in any of this project? 
Okay, the first question. Uh, the Carrizo Aquifer runs from, it runs southwest and northeast, and it basically runs from Mexico up through Louisiana, Arkansas. It, it's a huge aquifer. It is not like the Edwards in the fact that it's very flashy. You know, you, you, know, you, you watch the news, they give you the aqua level every day. And it could go, if you have a big rain, it could go up 10 feet. And then you can watch it drop to the two acre foot or two feet a day during peak ag season or uh, summer months. So it's not flashy like that. It's, it's more of a stable aquifer. Austin, uh, they have decided to <coughs> conserve more, conserve their way out of the drought. They have one source of water that's out of the Colorado. So that lake system provides water to Austin. And they're roughly at 30% uh, capacity in their supplies. Thank so, you. so we have. Oh, no, so. Yes, sir. Uh, so just so real quick. Can, I'm sorry, we had to limit questions after yours because we have a uh, full schedule. Uh, okay, that's yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions outside if you want. Go okay, ahead, so. Since you're dealing with uh, commercial sources, uh, can you say a little bit about uh, what SAWS would do? They go bankrupt or some other way fail to follow through on their side of the deal. There are safeguards in place, um, but if, if out of going back consortium fails, um, you eventually would have the opportunity to take over the infrastructure that's in place. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. And again, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Running for District 2 um, in November, uh, just a couple of weeks from or basically right now. <laughs> the voting is on. So we have our current councilman, Keith Tony, present, uh, Alan Warwick, Nintendo McIntosh, and uh, Tyrone Dart. Okay. So I posted one question to each of these gentlemen and asked that they respond to it uh, individually, of course, and then after each one of them has been able to respond to the single question, that will open up the floor for uh, questions from, from the audience. So the question I came up with, what is the pressing challenge facing Mankey Park neighborhood uh, today, and how would they respond to that challenge? So we'll start off with the uh, Thank you, it's a pleasure to be back here with you. Uh, from my standpoint, the pressing question we're making part right now is whether or not the city will be allowed to impose uh, a 30% rule on you for this historic designation to even, and I understand that the city explains as to get the ball rolling, so to speak, 30% uh, is 30%, and it's not 51%, and that will be. And that's a problem for me as the council person. And uh, I, from my standpoint, that's a uh, one of the more pressing issues, the most pressing issue I see right now. Uh, and uh, I'm here to pledge to you tonight that uh, my vote will never be for that. As a matter of fact, I've initiated a CCR so that we can uh, stop this thing. And then beyond the CCR, we uh, will take the steps. The CCR is an initial step, and I have the signatures required for that. So that, that's very much my but that beyond that, we will uh, take steps to see that this doesn't happen, not just the Manning Park, but no, to no one else in this city again. 51% is 51%, 30 is 30, and then the 20 shall be. It just doesn't make sense to me. Thank you. Okay, have everybody go through, and then you can ask questions after everybody has had a chance to answer the question. Mr. Wolf. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Uh, again, I'm Alan Moore, I'm running for City Council District 2, and uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, again, I agree with uh, Councilman Tony that uh, this is the most pressing issue. If you drive through the neighborhood or run through the neighborhood, which I have, uh, you will see all the signs and uh, you will talk to the people that are very, uh, uh, feel very strongly about the issue. And I would say that uh, we need to possibly uh, rethink 30% for the future because um, the way the process has been done is definitely not transparent. Uh, it's not 
I think we could look at a more Austin-like method, uh, going back to 51%, but uh, limiting it to 45 days instead of the two-year period uh, for them to uh, get the application completed. So I think 45 days is reasonable, and I also uh, think a one-year kind of hold period before another application is submitted is also a good idea um, in order to um, have people uh, not be bombarded constantly with the attempts to make it a historic district. Uh, I would also think that um, it should be more on a public forum uh, as opposed to uh, a petition-based uh, situation because uh, you can kind of clandestinely do the petition without uh, all of your neighbors being aware that the situation is going on. I think that uh, would make things more transparent in the future and allow things to go forward in a much smoother fashion. Good evening. I'm Tom McIntosh. Uh, <clears throat> And I'm going to echo what the, the, the other two gentlemen have just spoken about, in that, well, I I live in Dignity, and Dignity wasn't a historic district at one point in time, and it became a historic district. I've lived there, I got there right after it became a historic district. Um, if I was in the district at the time, I would vote, you know, I would, I would not be in favor of that initiative. But what, 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 what I can say is that, since since it since that has occurred and it is a historic district, I think the the it, it has helped spur development and more folks coming in because it made the neighborhood more visible and I think you know it was beneficial. So that's what I'm saying to you guys. We're in the process now. But I think the process should remain the same as it has always been. And however other districts became um, historic and should still remain that same sort of criteria for developing the historic district. But, you know, this is an internal matter to the Mankey Park, and I think whatever decision comes out of it, then I think we go forward and um, you know, think about some other issues in the neighborhood that we can make sure that development happens and what you would like to be reflected. Thank you. Okay. My name is Tom Rodarden, um, and born and raised in San Antonio. These, these young men have said pretty much all the answers you said about the, the uh, historic rule of the 30% and the 51%. For me, um, I believe there's a totally different situation that we can address as a council person. Born and raised on the east side. When we talk about District 2, for the most part, that's all you hear about is the east side. When I ran um, in the last election in 2013, uh, campaigning out on the northeast side, they told me they felt like they were the stepchildren of, of District 2. And so for me, my, my thing is, the biggest, the biggest issue is making sure resources are coming throughout the entire district. Making sure that when we identify District 2, it's not just about the east side or east point or specific areas. And we do have uh, high areas of need in, in those areas. But Mankey Park is a part of District 2. There's other parts of District 2 that no one would ever know if we never spoke up about it. As a council person, I want to be all inclusive. I want to ensure that it's just not an issue when, when we're talking about historic needs or we're talking about a street or, or, or infrastructure need. But anytime we talk about District 2, we're talking about all parts of District 2. So for me, a major concern is including all parts of District 2 into the conversation, especially when we're talking about resources. But, but just in general, we're all one big family. We need to come back together and figure out how to do that. So just that connectivity to the district and being a part of the district. The district. Thank you. I think you had a question for Councilman Tony. Um, I can't remember the words that you used, um, but I think you were talking initially. You were talking about the thirty percent or the fifty-one percent. I think I'm going to paraphrase because, like I said, I can't remember exactly what you said. Did you say you're going to stop this thing? And, and I think, and, and I wanted to understand a little bit more what you meant about that. Did you mean getting more clarification on the thirty percent and how that works? That's what I want to understand. Yes. What you meant with the words that you said. Exactly. Exactly. Because it, not not just the thirty percent, but the fact that it looks like the city is giving those who are pro historic time and time again to reach their magic numbers. When if you're not, you get one shot. But you can go. I'm here. You can go here. You can go here. 
So they have different milestones for you. And, and, and I think I said the last time I was here, whether Mankey Park wants to be historic or not is up to Mankey Park residents, and that's fine. The issue I have is that 30% can decide whether or not the process moves forward. I just don't think that's fair. And, and I, will, I will fight that and I stand against it. Okay, so what is what is it that we the CCR that you're, or is that what you said the CR is? What is right. what is that that you're that you right that thirty percent goes away? That, what? that number goes away, and and it will become a fifty one percent. So, so you're saying that fifty one percent of the people should petition even before the city decides whether this is good and it comes to the people for discussion. That's right. But ultimately, you're right. You, you keyed on it. It <laughs> comes to the people for discussion. But 30% should not drive the process. So you would have to get 51% of all the people who own property in the district to say we want to even start thinking about it. We want to do it diplomatically and we want to do it democratically and we will do it that way. I, I, would, I agree with everyone in here who has a well, then, I, That begs the question of what, um, if 51% say, let's do it, why even go through the, the charade of talking about it? Well, you have to talk about it. We're going we're gonna to leave it up to you. I mean, I, I'm off of that. So, so then the process is trying to talk the 51% out of it? Right now, the 30% 30, 30 are driving. Right now, 30% are driving. I think some people here have a problem with that. I certainly do. And if I live here, I would definitely have a problem. So that's, that's it. We just flipped it so that it's fair history. I think there are other issues other than the historic in Mankey Park. And one of the things I want to ask each of you is about development. I heard some discussion about development. Um, we have a neighborhood plan. We have the first neighborhood plan that, that the city ever had. It's been updated time after time. A lot of neighbors spent a lot of time updating this plan. But yet, we have people come to us, and even though our neighborhood plan says there be, there's no commercial development in this area, or um, this should only stay residential, we have people come and, and want to develop that, and we went through the NCD pro process, and so I'm, I'm wondering, what good does this, does this neighborhood plan, does us coming together as a group do, if someone petitions the city, the city and, 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 and it gets overrun, a.k.a. the Broadway, a.k.a. gosh, a number of Carnahan Street. Carnahan Street, a Leo. number of issues. That's the name of it. I'm asking everybody. Okay. Well, I'll get over I'm up here. <laughs> Tell us, what is our neighborhood plan and what does the NCD do for us? Yeah. And well, will, you, will you support it if we come into a zoning or a, an issue, will you stand on our side? Because we've had council people who sat on the other side of the table. Yeah. I'll stand on the side of the people, and I always have and I always will. Now, just like they say in court, in light of new evidence, if you get new evidence, you have to think new about the problem, about the issue. And we'll do that. But I do stand on the side of the folks, and I've done that, and I, I did that for Bank Park, and I'll continue to do it. But you're talking basically about zoning. I'm talking and, about zoning, and, yes. Yeah, you're talking about zoning, and, and I know that that can be a hairball. It really can be. Um, and and with, look at each one individually, in each case individually. However, however, by and large, you want to follow the rule of the folks and the will of the people, and that's what we try to do. As far as your neighborhood plan is concerned, I think that uh, everything that's currently zoned residential should be residential, but any things that are commercial or on the outskirts, um, you may have to think about uh, buffer zones, because there's going to be a lot of heavy commercial growth on Broadway, and you may, um, may have some vacant, vacancy issues in those areas because uh, you need areas in between heavy commercial uh, time back to residential. So your corners, I wouldn't say necessarily would be up for grab, but um, you as a community may agree that I wouldn't want to live behind, let's say a car wash or a Whataburger. Um, this, this may be okay for a law office, or this may be okay for, for some other uh, kind of uh, mixed use uh, situation. So I think we have to look on the, on the side of growth and maintaining the character of the neighborhood, but also, um, 
do what makes sense as far as cities. If you've lived in another city, you know that on your corners, um, they tend to be more commercial. And then when you work into the central areas of the block, it's going to be residential on just about every case, unless it's a major thoroughfare. Yes, uh, I would, I, as a city council person, I'm, I'm going to consider, I, I would like to know that people are active and have a vocal voice in what they want and what they see on the paper, and that's great. But I, I also think that it should be case by case, it shouldn't be just carte blanche that however it exists today, it should never change. And, um, but my feeling is that, is that as, as things come up, and if it's a business, if it's something that they're engaging with you folks to say, hey, this is this is the idea, what we want to do. Is this something y'all can support? Is this something that you cannot support? And um, and come to some sort of some sort of agreement with these people if you can. And if not, then then it will come to city council or whatever it may be to decide on these issues. But I think there should be some opening for to say, hey, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not an urban planner or a city planner. You know, I don't know. You know, I can't predict the future of what San Antonio will look like or or, or um, you know what what we want to do is at least keep an open mind to say that um, you know have some businesses in different places because even in my neighborhood, you know, I don't I don't I would like to support businesses in my neighborhood. I'd like to be able to walk out by the door and go to a restaurant, okay? And so, you know, I think that that would be the case for some people here. And I don't want the most vocal people to always, you know, carry away and say, okay, this can't be here because I'm the loudest person. And, you know, my group of friends dictate what happens in this neighborhood. And that's my I'm just asking that everyone look at our neighborhood plan that's been filed with the city and somebody follow the neighborhood plan. It says no develop it says no commercial development here. Don't develop commercial here. Okay. I mean I would, I would look at I would consider the neighborhood plan, but I can't say I would follow it uh, completely. Mm -hmm. Okay, you had a question. What's the point of having you? Real, 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 real simple. As the city council person, I will be elected by the people for the people. It doesn't matter if I'm a city planner, urban planner, whatever title I can have outside of that position, I'm elected to represent you. And if you say in your neighborhood plan that this is what you want, that's what I'm going to fight for, and that's what I'm going to stand for. At the end of the day, it's not about what I think is, what is best. It's about going back to the people and whatever the people say is best. And so I'm never going to be on the other side of the table from the people. And that's Lanky Park, that's Sunrise, Eastwood, anybody in District 2, whoever I'm representing, it's always going to be about what your interests are, not mine or anyone outside of the district. So to answer your question, yes, ma'am, whatever the plan is that this organization, this group, this community, this neighborhood came up with, that's what I have to follow through on because that's what I'm elected to do. To serve the people, to serve the people's community. So yes, and yes, and yes, your question. Thank you. Tyrone Darden. Tyrone Darden. Thank you. North Tyrone Darden. I have a I have a concern about the fifty one percent because uh, if you wait until fifty one percent for people to start dialoguing, <laughs> it's even more of a done deal than it was when it came to the 30 percent. It's, I think that intuitively that sounds good, but in reality that will encourage less dialogue than we've even had in the past 30 percent. We need to begin dialoguing earlier than the 30 percent before we tear each other apart and hook each other's eyes out. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for the panel? Yeah. Um, I guess for everyone, just to make this a little bit more broad, um, how do you, council uh, <laughs> candidates, uh, how do you feel about the historic ordinance as a tool for neighborhoods maintaining their neighborhood quality? And I, when I say that, I want to I want to understand that we have the historic process and we have the neighborhood conservation district. Each is a tool. One of them has two staff people behind it. One of them has about 16 people behind it. 
The one that has two people behind it, which is the NCD, the Neighborhood Conservation District, it's got holes all over. You can see them all over our neighborhood. Historic doesn't. That's a stronger tool. I want to know how you feel about neighborhood historic designation as a strong tool for neighborhoods to be able to have. It is a, it is a strong tool, and it's up to how the neighborhoods use it. It's ultimately your call how you use it. Uh, and you're right, NCD has holes in it. It has lots of holes in it. Uh, historic designation is something, again, that's your call. That is absolutely your call. Um, you've heard that somebody thinks that it would be a good idea up here. And so if you think it's a good idea, that's fine. That's fine. I think that on both sides, the, the, the rhetoric has gotten ramped up just a little, a little much. Some people were saying we can't paint our houses the color we want. I don't know that that's true or not. But if that's, I don't think that's true. I think that's a little too much. And so, on both sides, I think that the rhetoric has gotten out of hand. But, if it's something that you really want, again, back to dialogue, have your dialogue. That's fine. I don't think that there's an issue, not with me, with whether or not you're historic or not. The thing is, if that's what you want, that's fine. As long as you have a clear understanding of what it does, what it doesn't do. Protections it provides, protections it doesn't provide. And, and that's your call. So, but in, in NCD, again, I hear your point on that. Uh, from what I know, it, uh, it's like Swiss cheese, but, uh, and, and they have plenty of folks to fix it. And why that's happened, I don't know. I do think it's a tool uh, that can be used properly. The main thing is that it's not an economic barrier to growth. Uh, you want people to be able to move into the neighborhood um, to where uh, it's not a King William uh, type situation where there are so many restrictions and, and so much overhead costs that you're, you're hindering growth in, in the community. And, and, and that's uh, really what I'm looking to prevent. I, I like being able to uh, protect the quality of the current quality of the neighborhood, but I also want to have, uh, allow new people to move in without so many barriers. I think uh, the historic designation, um, it's, it's good in theory, uh, but in terms of my experience, it does push up the cost of renovating your home. The time it takes to plan the permitting process, it does make it work. And I'm concerned about other members in the community that may not be a vocal or outspoken, or who don't have the wealth, or they don't have the means, they've been living in the neighborhood for years, okay? Maybe they're on a fixed income. Maybe they're, you know, don't have the, the means to go through that whole process, um, increase costs, and um, I, I, I think we're talking about fear at times. Just speaking specifically to, to the question, based on what you said as far as one group having two members and the other group having 16, as a council person, I'm looking at if those are uh, council appointed positions or, or uh, at the city level, they make those decisions. I believe that we have to look at that organization to see how can we strengthen it. If we're going to use that as a tool, whether it's going to work for or against, just two people in the department can't, can't, can't run that department effectively and efficiently. So the first thing I would do is look at that portion of it to see how we can improve it. And if we can't improve it, go a different direction in terms of making sure we meet the needs that that department or that organization is doing. Outside of that, at the end of the day, and going back to this young lady said, the, the conversation should always be going. Because we always want to improve our neighborhood. We always want to keep the quality of life high. We want to improve the quality of life. And it shouldn't be a reactive type of situation. We're waiting until something goes wrong or something the boogeyman is about to come scares out of our homes. We, if we're always continuously talking and always continue looking for the resources to make sure, to ensure the good things are there and we improve the things that need help, then we'll be okay. But, but I agree that the conversation shouldn't start when, when there's an issue. We should always be talking about it. And that comes from having a connection to, to your representative and having a connection in your community. And that, that's something that I want to promote and I will promote as a council person. We've, uh, we've been out, changing gears here a little bit. We've been uh, asking this question for over 20 years whenever we've had uh, uh, council and mayor candidates come to speak to us. So it's a two-part question. I'm going to start with Mr. Dark. Thank you. Um, 
And the, the first part of the question is, what's the last book you read? And the second part of the question is, what's your favorite movie? Um, <laughs> the, the, the first the book I'm currently reading right now is uh, Resident, Resident Leader. Um, I'm a uh, student out in the lake for the leadership uh, PhD program, so I'm currently reading that right now. And then the, my favorite movie is Memento. Probably never heard of it. Okay, we have. Uh, excellent movie. I, I watched it in college and I've watched it probably once or twice a month. It's, it's a great movie. Thank you for the question. <laughs> the last book I read was uh, uh, The Master of Margarita, I think it's by. And my favorite movie is Dogville. What was the movie, sir? Dogville. Uh, the last book that I read was uh, Delivery Happiness by Tony Shea. It's, uh, he's the uh, creator of Amazon, or I mean, I'm not sorry, the part of Amazon, but it's, it's Apple's. And uh, he talks about um, all the customer service uh, things that are doing differently and how he grew their company and how he grew a bunch of companies to didn't really uh, find happiness in it until he was able to do it his way and keep it his way. So it's a culture, it's, a, it's about a corporate culture. Uh, and developing culture for your organization. And then uh, Fight Club. The last book I read was Lincoln. Uh, because, um, and, and, and I don't just embrace Lincoln for the obvious reasons. <laughs> but because Lincoln was really a masterful politician behind the scenes, and people don't know that, it wasn't a pushover. He was a typical Illinois politician, and we'll leave that alone. <laughs> but he was a typical Illinois politician, and uh, my favorite movie is Pat. Uh, going beyond Mankey Park and even beyond District 2 now, uh, would each of you tell us what you think the, the two or three major issues facing the City Council in the next term will be? And, yeah, let's, well, let's start with Garden again. Yes. Just, just uh, obviously, uh, Councilman Tony knows all the inside information. But based on things that we hear in the media, things that we talk about in the community, obviously the, uh, the, the safety with the, the police officers and even the fire department, they have negotiations going on with them. We have a, the, the light rail, that was a, a big thing. I've heard uh, some people on the outside in our community saying they're going to try to do some campaigns to get something similar, if not that same thing, back, whether it be on the, on the ballot or referendum or even talks or getting, getting that back in. But even without that, our transportation, we, we need. Better, better transportation of communities. Everyone doesn't drive a car, everyone doesn't uh, have that, that mode of transportation. So for working people who want to get across town and have those different ways, different ways jobs, we got to make sure our transportation is, is, is good. So working with VA, getting them up to, up to par, but making sure our fire and our, and our police officers take care of the well. Um, the issue I think that's going to be a, a focal point on in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the future is looking at downtown development um, in terms of uh, new buildings going up, the buildings that are there now currently that are vacant, and who knows who the owner is, and they're dilapidated. So I think things, things of that nature are going to be something that needs to be looked at. Um, looking at growth you know, in these areas, not just out of the periphery, in terms of uh, making these places much more livable in terms of you know what sort of amenities, food systems, and things that are in this area. And I'm a I'm a I'm a complete advocate of public transportation. You know I'm out here taking a nine, fourteen, and a ten pretty much every day. I ride my bike. I take my bike on the bus. My son goes to St. Peter's up in Alamo Heights. So we're on the bus daily, and you know I see the type of people that are on the bus and. You know, whenever there's something about buses, it just gets boiled down because no one, you know, the average person does has never taken the bus this way. But that's one thing I have done, and I've done it when I was a lieutenant. People look at me like I'm crazy, getting on the bike with my uniform, and 
it, it, it was a conversation starter. But it shouldn't be that way. It should be, hey, boss, normal, normal way to life. I'm a New Yorker from New Yorker, came here about uh, ten years ago, and everybody takes the bus. Millionaires, uh, poor people, everyone. So you know, I'd like to see that here. I do agree that uh, public safety funding is <coughs> one of the and then uh, for the other second item is uh, center city development as well. Um, what I see in San Antonio, I haven't seen in any of the major cities that are that are still major cities, and it's uh, properties inside the city being less valuable than properties uh, on the outskirts uh, around the loop. So that's uh, one of the things that definitely needs to be addressed because they're talking about raising property taxes in San Antonio. You know, it's, it's kind of come up in a, in a lot of occasions, but there's a lot of unused properties or underused properties that could definitely um, use some spurring um, from, the, from the city to uh, get development downtown and uh, bring people downtown. We're growing at uh, a little higher rate, I think, um, than what you're projecting at 20,000. I'm seeing six and a half percent, which is about 250 people a day. So that's about 90,000 people are coming to San Antonio every year. Now, do we want them in San Antonio or do we want them in Seguin, New Braunfels, Floresville? I think we want a lot of them in San Antonio because the infrastructure is already here and it's going to be cheaper to uh, grow if we, if we grow in areas where we already have infrastructure as opposed to building further out and sprawling out. And it's definitely going to be better for the environment as well. Well, Mr. Darby touched on it. He's absolutely right. And, and oh, first of all, let me establish that because your own city council does not give you a crystal ball, so I don't know exactly what the, what the issue will be. Uh, I can tell you right now, for here and now, uh, we can't afford to go broke as much as we love our public servants. And I'm the brother of a retired cop, and it makes for interesting that conversation. But we can't afford to go broke, but we want to be fair to them. So that's going to be a tough nut to crack. For one segment, not the other. One's at the table, one isn't. You read the papers, you know which one is there, which one isn't. The next thing is going to be growth. Uh, again, I, I agree with Mr. Burke, your numbers are woefully small. Um, that people are coming here, they're coming, they're bringing their vehicles, they're bringing their children, they're bringing their families, but not one of them is bringing a drop of water with them. They're not. And we have to understand that for years, we've said we want alternative water sources other than the Edwards. So now we're doing that. DSAL, and we're doing it, and our conservation efforts are being great, but water is going to be the driving force because this is what happens. It's like dominoes that fall, and these dominoes have fallen. Now, that I have been privy to. Our companies that want to come here, they want to set up shop, and they want to hire six, seven hundred people or more. But the first thing they say is, what about the water problem? They know, even internationally, they know. They know. It was just a jumping to Japan. And we did get two companies out of uh, 15 or 20 that, that uh, were talked to, council uh, contingent that went there. I didn't go that this time. I hope you go next time. <laughs> and we're going to get some, some jobs here to do too. But beyond that, it's water. They ask about the water. They know. They know. They know that we got Toyota here on the ring of prayer. Only because of the water. Not because of the workforce, not because of anything else. Water. Water's an issue. So we have to have, whether it's the pipeline, listen, I'm just saying we have to have an alternative source of water. So that's number one. Number two would be our public service and making sure that they have a good package, but a package that's sustainable. For the city. Next question. Already? Do you have a question? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my more of a comment. Um, just with um, all of you, except for Tyrone, we're back in development in Kennedy uh, Park. And, uh, I don't know really what y'all mean by development, what that means. And I'm dealing with the bad of my street right now about the commercial and not following a uh, master plan. So I really just don't understand what, when you say we want to support development in your neighborhood, what that means. What does that mean to me as a person that 
lives in the Mead Park, and that if there is development in my neighborhood, yeah, I'd like a restaurant. Who wants to go to a restaurant? Go down my street. So I just don't understand what y'all are, what you mean when you say developers. Because we can build so many more houses. So what is, what is it that y'all mean? Whoever wants to I think I may mention it. I'm not sure if I mentioned it in that. Residential development, um, my background's in architecture. So if you look at the way the cities were developed for thousands of years, the, the corners of the main thoroughfares, if you look at um, whatever's connected to Broadway, that's typically commercial and, and uh, a little bit on the New Broadway side, but not as much. Uh, in the center of the, of the street, especially on a small residential street, there's not going to be any commercial development. And um, no commercial businesses. There's not, there's not enough traffic going through those areas. So there's a number of reasons why you wouldn't do that. So um, maybe I didn't say this, but uh, the, the main thing is that the houses, when, when people are redoing them, it's quality work. Um, it, it builds in the character that's already there. It can't be as old as the house um, that's next to it if, it if it's being built right now. So they're going to use the materials of our time to. Uh, Play, uh, I guess, play against the materials that are that are used in here, depending on the style that they're using for the architecture of the building. But that's the main thing that I would like to see in all of our development, not necessarily just in Mickey Park, but there's a ton of old homes in Dipper Heights and Digging with Hill and the areas in between that we're going to have to make these same decisions on. And I just want a more transparent process so that we don't have to have these two year or three year long struggles uh, and we can just grow as a community and uh, build this city, uh, rebuild the downtown again. Anybody have a slide to respond? Well, when I say development, I'm, I'm talking about um, in terms of housing stock, so that you have, you know, they're vacant lots and things like that, that that we, you know, get some really spur on development of, of residential, maybe one family, two families at most. Because we don't want to overdevelop, you know. And, and yes, restaurants would be great, but then there's the issue of parking. And I know that is a nightmare because I have a nursing home at the corner of my my street, and every single day they park in my car, and it drives me crazy. But but I think the, the the thing about it is, but when you have you know, these historic designations, it makes it hard for a developer to come in and say, I'm going to build a housing unit here because it just made my cost probably go up by 20% 30%. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, that's not true. That's a <laughs> well, well, well. From what I know, from what I know is, okay, I I have to uh, take out my windows and scrape them and put glue on them and put them back together. Okay, I can't go. You know, I personally can't go and buy a a a, a, a wood marble window for a thousand bucks to pop for I don't know twenty million in my house. Okay? So those are the kind of things. So if you're telling me that you can build cheaply in a historic destination, you know, tell me, prove, prove me wrong. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll listen. I'll listen. Okay. And then, you know, even, even, even sometimes, even, even historic designation doesn't taste as subjective. So you're gonna disagree on what that place looks like. I think no matter what. I mean, there are new houses in that were built in King William. And I said, cool. How did this get built? Look terrible, but you know, probably check all the uh, the yacht. I mean, that's a very true question. Clarification: I didn't say that anything should be built cheaply. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 nice shot. <laughs> Nobody said that. No, don't don't build cheaply. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. Why well, did Mr. Tony to address my question too? Yeah. Development. I'll address your real question. Uh, I'll address your real comment. Your real comment is about uh, 
about the coffee house. The real comment that is not We're back there. My real comment is about what do y'all mean about development? I didn't say development, first of all, but I'll address your question. I, I, I never said it because I, I know better. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here before. But I will tell you that for development for me, it's not my call. It really isn't. Whether you're talking commercial development, now that's the first thing you have to do. I don't know what you mean by whoever said development, I don't know if they specified commercial versus residential. But I would do that. That's why they mentioned that. Because I wanted specific. And they said commercial or residential development. If you want residential development, again, to Mr. Gordon's point, as long as it coincides with the community and what you have now, if you have a problem with it, then I have a problem with it. If you don't, I don't. And I think that that there you lies well. Now let's go to commercial development on the street. I think I mentioned before case by case basis. Now you just wholeheartedly, whole clock say, we're gonna allow someone to put a water burger up in the middle of your block. That just doesn't pass the common sense test. But back to case by case, if there are mitigating factors that need to be corrected and fixed based on those mitigating factors, which we've gone round and round about, then there may be exceptions made. Not for whatever purpose, certainly. Not for that. Y'all already struggled through having a car wash there, and, and I know you've got a little buffer there, but that car wash is right there. I know that's a struggle for you. Parking is a struggle for you, which is why, case by case again, the city tries to mitigate that by doing a parking study, which I think you're aware of, a parking study, oh yeah, that there would be a parking study done to ensure that disruption to new residents is mitigated. And that whomever does, and I'm talking commercial development now, whomever engages in that commercial development would have to meet city standards before they get an okay. Yes, sir. Do you think the, you, you're all familiar, you spoke about making sure that the residential development is consistent and appropriate. Do you think that the current mechanism that the city has in place, given our NCD, has the teeth to make sure that the residential development is consistent and appropriate? Or do you think something should be done to give it to you? I think you can always improve anything. And in, in, in my time on city council since August 14th, which only seems about 10 years ago, but it really has been 10 years, I have found that there are many things that the city needs to shore up. Um, and, and, and give it more to you. So you can almost say that across the board, unfortunately, that perhaps it, it does need to have a little more push behind, a little more power, a little more muscle to get things done because you're going to get some developers that will try to slide sliding under the wire on you. You have to be very careful and very diligent about it because you don't have to, uh, Mr. Work is an architect, but you'll have to be an architect and look and say, that doesn't fit here. It's Spanish colonial, it's this, it's that, it doesn't fit here. Um, it's new age. You get a new age house in your block that's made out of corrugated steel and chicken wire, you're going to have a fit and you should. You'll look and see that. And hopefully, the city would have the teeth. But I think you're right. They're, they probably need to shore it up. Any guys want to shore? Well, I, I, I don't believe the city should have any teeth. People should have teeth. And just like this young lady that again said about the, the master plan, why are we talking about all these other things when we've already established the master plan? We should always go back to the master plan. So, you know the, 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 the city should have the team. I believe the people should have the team. And the, the city should be enforcing well, yeah, but it, that leaves us to self police. Well, no. And, and, and anytime something's being built, we have to, like, kind of. Well, well, this is what I mean you know, by the checklist and that's what the city should do. Being specific. The city shouldn't do anything against what you've already said you want to do. That being as specific as possible. 
I, I'm not saying if we want to fix that pothole, like I'm not where everybody's going to say, come and do that. But if we already established we want nice streets, then we're going to make the streets nice. We should, it should take over. That's the city saying, yes, you should, but it's not the city coming in saying, no, you should not do that. And that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. People are coming in and doing things that should not be done by our plan, and the city's doing nothing. And going back to the original statement, we've already worked on the master plan. We should always go back to that master plan. Yeah, but it didn't work. It didn't work. And, and I'm saying as a city council person, yeah. that's going to be the same. Because the people have already agreed what they want. And so it's my, my, group, my job as a serving leader to make sure that happens. And if you want to change it, then we can talk about that too. Like she said, we can always have a conversation about it. We shouldn't have to wait. This is a question to the, how often is the master plan updated? It, it's it's it, supposed it, to be it, a major uh, two, two, five, five years. Five years. Five years. Five years. Five years. So and it's not just updated five years ago? Yeah, it's not just two people sitting in a room. It's a, a bunch of committees working on it. Because, I mean, we're having this conversation this evening, but we're not the entire neighborhood, and we can't even pretend to be half the neighborhood. Um, and a, a lot of us, <laughs> A lot of us are owners that don't live in the neighborhood as well, so that there, there are different things that we need to take into account. Again, I want a more transparent process. I want something that's going to bring everybody into the room so we can really have a conversation about this. And I don't think it's currently in place, and I think something like that should be in place. I think I want a simple question that won't require a response. Uh, for the four men that are up there, please tell me with a show of hands, how many have actually looked at the Mankey Park plan and spent more than 30 minutes with <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. <laughs>
That's what's been done in, in years past. Thanks for coming. Thanks for your time. Appreciate all the questions. Good program. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.